Hi guys, welcome back to another video. Today I'll be showing you why you should self-host a file server and exactly how to do it. Let's get started. To look into why you should self-host a server, let me first tell you what self-hosting is. Instead of having your files stored remotely on Google or Microsoft servers halfway across the world, your files are stored in your own house, on your own server. You manage the server configuration, including who has access to your files. You're able to have full control of your files, and they're not in the hands of a corporation. Besides having much better privacy and peace of mind, another reason to self-host is cost. All major cloud storage companies charge for either an annual or monthly subscription, which can pile up over time as you require more storage space. While Google offers 15 gigs for free, the price can quickly rise depending on how much storage you require. The same goes for OneDrive and iCloud subscriptions. Now, with all those reasons, it's time to self-host. First, you're going to need to set up a server. For a server computer, any old PC will work fine. I found this one in the trash some time ago. It's got an i3 processor, a 250 gig hard drive, and gigabit ethernet, which is plenty enough to run a Linux server. With our hardware ready, it's time to install an OS. Although many people don't prefer hosting on Ubuntu, it's my personal choice because it's easier to use and good for beginners. We can grab the Ubuntu ISO from the Ubuntu website, making sure to select server and not desktop. I'm using 18.04 LTS since it's the second newest version and it's still supported until 2028. Once the ISO is finished downloading, it's time to flash it to a USB drive. So grab a USB drive and insert it into your computer. Then open up a flasher like Rufus or Blenna and select your USB drive and your ISO. Finally, click start to flash the USB drive. After you're finished flashing your USB, plug it into your server along with a keyboard, a display, and a power cable. Then, boot it up while pressing F2, Delete, or F8 to get into the BIOS. Once you're into the BIOS, navigate to the boot section. Then, Move your USB drive to the top, just like that. After your USB drive is at the top, go to Save and Exit and click Save Changes and Reset. It will reboot into your Ubuntu install. After the initial boot messages, the Ubuntu installer will show up. Select your preferred language, in this case English, and then your preferred keyboard layout. Then choose to continue to update to the new installer or to continue without updating. I'm going to continue without updating the installer. Then click done and choose your network connection. Then we can move on to partitioning our disk. When the disk partitioner comes up, click Use an Entire Disk. Use the main disk and click Done to partition. Now fill in your name, your server's name, your username, and your password. After choosing your settings on the installer, wait for the installer to complete. Finally, remove the installer media and reboot into your Ubuntu server.
After it's finished rebooting, enter your login and password that you configured earlier. Great, now you're logged into your Ubuntu server. Now, it's always a lot easier to work on your server from another mach machine via SSH. So you can go ahead and move your server into somewhere like a closet so that it won't bother you. Then, we need to find the IP address of the server in order to SSH into it. To do this, open up your web browser. Then, search for your IP router's IP address. Then go to Connected Devices. Under Connected Devices, find your server's hostname, Yeet Server, for me. Then find its IP address. Note this down so you can input it into your SSH application. Now that you have the IP address, we can connect to your server via SSH. To do this, open up something like Putty, an SSH client. In Putty, enter your IP address of your server. Then click Open. It'll ask you to accept or deny the certificate of the server. Click Yes. Then enter your login info. There, you're finally logged in to your SSH. Now you can enter any commands that you want on your server. Firstly, we're going to update our server. To do this, type sudo apt update. Enter your sudo password, which is just the password to your account, and then click enter. This command will tell you how many packages can be upgraded by reinitializing the repositories. After this, type sudo apt upgrade dash y to upgrade all of your packages. After your updates are complete, we should initialize our firewall. This is one of the first things you should do on any new server. Your firewall is what prevents unwanted connections to anything on your server. To initialize the firewall, we have to first add a rule that allows our SSH connection. To do this, type sudo UFW allow open SSH. It'll say rules are updated. Then type sudo UFW enable to enable the firewall. It'll say that the firewall is active and now enabled on system startup. So now your server will com completely refuse any connection that's not SSH. This is a great protection measure for your server. With our updates in place and our firewall installed, there's one more thing I'd like to do on this server, and it's to install a service called fail to ban fail to ban basically blocks connections, SSH connections that have tried to brute force your connection. To install fail to ban, type sudo apt install fail to ban. After fail to ban installed is installed, type sudo fail to ban client status. It should tell you there's one jail and that's SSHD. This means your fail to ban client is working. Now, there's one more thing you should install on your server, and that's Canonical Live Patch. Live Patch basically implements security fixes to the Linux kernel without requiring a reboot. To install Live Patch, we first need a token from Canonical. So open your web browser and navigate to auth.livepatch.canonical.com. Then log in with your Ubuntu One account, or create a Ubuntu One account, and copy down the token you get. Now, go back to your SSH se session and type sudo snap install canonical dash live patch.
Wait for it to download and then install. Then go back to your Chrome window and copy the second command listed under your token. Then switch back to your SSH window and click and right click to paste it. Click enter. It'll say successfully enabled device using that machine token. This means that Canonical Live Patch is now working on your server. Now we can move on to installing a Nextcloud file server instance on your server. Nextcloud allows you to store and sync a variety of files so you can access them from anywhere. It also backups certain files, like photos and contacts, from your phone or your other devices. We'll be installing the Nextcloud Snap using the Snappy packaging system on Ubuntu. To install Nextcloud, go to your SSH session. Then type sudo snap install Nextcloud. Nextcloud will begin install. After it's finished installed, check if it's actually installed by typing snap list. Nextcloud should be listed as one of the installed snaps. Now, we need to configure Nextcloud with a username and password. To do this, type sudo nextcloud.manual-install username space password. After it says Nextcloud was successfully installed, we need to configure which web address your Nextcloud can be accessed on. So Nextcloud restricts access to web interfaces on your server without explicit permission. To give the permission for Nextcloud to access your server on your public IP address, type the command shown on screen. Now that we've set our public IP address as a trusted domain, we need to configure a self-signed certificate. To do this, type this code. It will generate a certificate and restart Apache. Finally, you need to allow ports 80 and 443 through your firewall in order to connect to your Nextcloud instance. To do this, type sudo ufw, UFW allow 80 comma 443 slash tcp. It'll say rule added. Then type sudo ufw reload. Your firewall will reload and now you can access your next cloud. Now to access your next cloud, go into your web browser and we need to set up some port forwarding rules. To set up port forwarding rules, enter the IP address of your Wi-Fi router. Then, click on Advanced and Port Forwarding. As you can see, in Port Forwarding, I've set up Nextcloud port 80 and Nextcloud port 443 on my server's IP address, so it can be accessible from anywhere. Now, open up a new tab and navigate to your public IP address. It might give you a warning that your connection isn't private, but proceed to the website. A window will come up asking you to sign in with your credentials. So go ahead and input your username and your password to sign in. Once you're signed in, you'll be able to see all of your files. There, now we have a Nextcloud file server running on your server. Now that you can use the Nextcloud web interface, it's time to install a client on your machine. This will allow you to automatically sync any changes to your files on the server to all of your different devices, whether they run OS X, Linux, or Windows. You can install these clients straight from the Nextcloud website or the App Store on your devices. Once you've installed a client, log in to your public IP address of your server with the username and password you made earlier. Now, you might have to bypass the certificate error in the Nextcloud client because your certificate still won't be trusted by default. Now, just like other file storage options, Nextcloud has a variety of apps that you can add, including Maps, SMS Sync, Tasks, and Audio Library. Nextcloud even includes two-factor authentication for even better data security. To add an app to your Nextcloud web page, 
Click your profile picture at the top right. Then click on plus apps. And then you can choose which apps you want to enable or disable. Now that we've installed Nextcloud and customized it to our tastes, we can add some tools that help us monitor the performance of our server. One such tool is Glances. Glances allows you to monitor different hardware, like your CPU, memory, disk, and network utilization, along with showing you a list of all the running processes on your system. To install Glances, type sudo apt install Glances. Then, you can invoke Glances by just typing Glances on the command line in your SSH window. You'll see a list of all your running processes along with the performance of your various disks, network, CPU, and memory. Now, you can access the list of your processes and your service performance through your SSH window, but what if you wanted to do it from another computer that didn't have SSH? Well, Glances can run a simple bottle web server so that all devices can access your service performance. To do this, we need to install Bottle. Before installing Bottle, we need to install the Python package manager, pip. To install pip, type sudo apt install python3 pip. After it is finished installing, type pip3 version to make sure it's installed. Then type pip3 install bottle. Now, to call your web server, we need to let it through the firewall. Since Glance's web server runs up port 61208, we can allow it through the firewall by typing sudo ufw allow 61208 slash tcp. This will allow it through the firewall. Now that you've allowed Glances through your firewall, simply invoke it by calling, by calling glances-w. Now, you can visit your server's IP address, colon 61208, and you'll see the Glances interface with a list of all your processes and your system performance. Another more comprehensive tool that lets you see system performance is NetData. NetData uses hundreds of metrics from all across your system to pr provide meaningful charts that allow you to analyze your system performance. It also notifies you of certain events like high disk utilization by using configurable and changeable alarms. To install NetData on your system, run the curl command shown on screen. Then, allow port 19999 through your firewall by typing sudo ufw allow 19999. Now, you can navigate to your server IP colon 19999 and you'll see the NetData interface. At the top, you'll see a system overview with all the main charts, and as you scroll down, you'll see more complicated things. You can also sign in to a NetData Cloud account with Google, which will allow you to receive alerts and to check your system server performance from anywhere around the world. By now, you should have a fully functioning, secure, self-hosted file server that you can remotely access and monitor. There are nearly endless possibilities from here on what you do with your server. If you successfully built this project or you have any questions, make sure to comment down below. If you liked this video, be sure to like and subscribe to my channel, and I'll see you in the next one.